It's no different from any other career path at the extent is that you may look to, to choose, you can easily research various companies now and you may choose to think that there's one that's that's preeminent in its field and they would be a good people to work for to learn um, to enhance my career position and you'd seek to apply for a position. And if you're really keen what you do, you, would, you wouldn't be too... Um, concerned about what the job was to begin with, but you'd actually start, and even better still, if you start as a student, you, you spend some time just working on the floor, so your equivalent of labouring, you learn how to sharpen a knife and do those sorts of things, and that provide you with some income to help you through your, through your studies, but it actually, um, probably more importantly in the long run, it, it gives you an appreciation for the whole scope of what things are done, and it forms a mental image for you, which is really important going forward, is to say, talk about something, you actually know what that entails or what that means. This is the Ryan Marketing Show, and you're listening to episode 79 of 100. Today on the show, I have Craig Hickson, CEO of Progressive Meats Limited, based here in Hastings, supplying a lot of the finest cuts of our beef, lamb, venison, and plenty more that not only us as New Zealanders rely on to have delicious meals, but internationally as well. So firstly, Craig, great to have you on the show. Thank you. I'm going to start with a, a simple question. You've been doing this for 30 plus years now. What keeps you coming back to it? It is all of my working life, starting off as a student and then through university holidays and with a stint with the meat board and uh, before I, in the Hawke's Bay Farmers Meat Company, before I set out on my own. So I had a, about, I think, a 10 year apprenticeship, which was a very good grounding and combination of both provincial interests and national perspective. So that was an important component of my time spent in Wellington before I came back to start out. What keeps me interested is uh, infinite variety. Uh, every year appears to be extraordinary, and we've got another one this year, but they're extraordinary for different reasons each year, and that's really part of the aspect. It's a dynamic uh, industry with lots of change. Now, let's talk a little bit about the industry for those that maybe aren't as familiar with the role that progressive meat plays in the supply chain between farmers and what we would buy at the supermarket or from a specialist a butchery, for example. Um, where does it sit and what role does it play? So out of necessity, when I, when I started in business, I was very short of capital. And so, in effect, I couldn't afford to own the land or the buildings. I couldn't afford to own the product. In, in terms of capital required for inventory management and I managed to scrape enough money together to be able to put some rather rudimentary equipment inside a building which um, I persuaded a group of investors to build on my behalf. And so we commenced our operation as a service provider because we didn't own the product so we provided as fee, fee for service to convert initially frozen carcasses into cuts. So that was at the forefront of a change that occurred in the industry which has been primarily carcass exports up until uh, right through the late late 1970s, early 1980s, um, apart from those that were required to be cut, which was about 5%. So 5% cuts, 95% carcass exporting up to about 1980. In the next 10 to 15 years, it switched completely over and went to 95% cuts and only about 5% in carcass form. And that was part of the transition that occurred during that time uh, and primarily and for very good economic uh, and marketing reasons was because the, the best world market price for each part of the carcass didn't reside with any one person in any one market sector or country and so by dividing the carcass up we were able to sell those bits. So that was, a, that was in fact um, not realised in my time at the meat board prior to that is that felt that the extra, pack, uh, extra cost of freight uh, would outweigh the value difference in you know, actually breaking the carcass down. But splitting it between market preferences actually proved to be a significant component. So the industry's um, often and loudly and continually criticised by those participants, some of which 
Um, criticism is well founded, others which is not. Uh, but there has been dramatic improvements over the time. It's just uh, never seems to be quite enough. Now, at that time when you started in 1981, um, I, I think that was with the you got funded into being able to provide a, like a boning room service to be able to break down these carcasses. With any live product, there's always the challenge of you may get a lot of demand for a particular style or cut, but you've got to sell, sell the whole animal. So it's not just a demand issue, you've also got a supply issue. How do you balance that and keep it in equilibrium so farmers is happy and consumers are happy with consistency of supply? Well, imperfectly. I mean, this, the simple statement of the role for any marketing manager in our business is that uh, and the component you referred to is we're a disassembly process. So we take something that's complete, whole and near perfect uh, and then we cut it into pieces and sell it to the various aspects. And because we disassemble, then the role of any marketing person is to sell all of those cuts at the best possible market price at the same time. Now, that ends up being a, an optimization that you always focusing on looking to deliver on and which you actually never achieve because it's actually virtually impossible with movements and exchange rate and other vagaries that occur to be able to sell you know all of the shanks in the same proportion of two two from the four shanks with uh, two legs from the back and fours from the front in natural fall as we call it or in proportion so that's uh, the single um, greatest challenge in being successful um, in the marketing or sales of the product, and it's, I would, um, I'm guessing, but I'd be reasonably sure that it would be the primary reason why startups fail is because they've been unable to sell all of the pieces equivalently at at good pricing at within the time frame of before their capital runs out. Right, because it is a it is a live product. Now you've got different brands to be able to you know, share that disassembled product amongst such as Lean Meats, DavMet, First Light Food, uh, Seafood Traders, and McCharty, I think is the last one there. What determines where the product goes? Is that something they ask from you to say, this is the volume we need on these dates? Um, or is it something that, that you provide to them saying, we've got this coming in because these farms have delivered these products to us? So we have a combination. In fact, look, I need to clarify. So Progressive Meats itself as a service provider, so it's a contract processor, and it was from and has remained so from its inception. So, in that, from that font, uh, we have been able to, my wife and I, invest in other associated companies, and not in all of the companies we deal with, but some, and they become customers of Progressive Meats ah, okay. for processing. But those other companies are the ones that market the product. So, Progressive Meats in, it, in its own right doesn't own any product or export or sell any product in its own name. So I'm a common factor you know, with regard to Ovation and with regard to Lean Meats, but not, for example, with Dadmet or McCharty or First Light um, Venison. So those entities themselves and the marketing managers that work within them have the role of, of selling the product. In terms of the matching of supply and demand, then I'm a very keen advocate of and have been promoting it and working through the process of commitment style procurement programs. So that's looking under our catch cry of being production to order. So when I started in the industry, I could very clearly see that an order from production approach meant that you had more or less opened your arms and accepted all the lambs that would come into Waka 2 when they were available, which was in the summertime. You built very large cold stores to spread it and then you looked to sell them over the year. And then you decided how you might sell them pretty well by what was on your stock sheet, which is I mean you waited to see what you've got and then to see what you did with it. Now, it wasn't entirely like that, but that was much the emphasis. Now, the, the turnaround in that to reduce the wastage is to actually have the message flowing from the marketplace, production to order, so right to the farmer, and then have a, have a program of supply product to specification to meet your expectations in terms of the demand. And we do that um, very clearly and follow that style of procurement right from when we first got involved in slaughter, which was 1987. And so both the Ovation and the Lean Meats programs are based on what I call them commitment style procurement programs. So we don't um, purchase from the sale yards. For example, we don't do per head or leg buying. We buy on a predetermined weekly schedule which has pricing in accordance with the categories of lamb. So very firmly of the view that you should be paid for the value of the product that you supply and we should receive the value 
that we pay for and the product that's delivered, and it's all aimed at waste reduction. So get it right on the farm and get it right there, then you maximise the value of the product from the farm, and hence that improves the returns um, overall to the farmer too and the concentration of having a higher proportion of his flock within desired categories. Right, so then as the farmer, there's some assurances that if they put certain processes in place on farm, that they'll be rewarded for those when it comes time to provide the stock to you. Yeah, so the, the key aspect around it is a degree of certainty within an uncertain environment because we're largely, and we're certainly influenced by weather, see by seasonal patterns and events can swing things considerably. And this um, commitment means that you know, we are committing to receive those animals at that particular point in time. So there's a security around, I call it, it's often colloquially referred to as space as well. Space. And particularly in the peak of the season, as you get farming conditions, if it's, um, if it's dry or some other aspect where animals really need to, you know, to go and, or, and when they're ready. This, our commitment style program, though, is designed so that you're planning to be when the animals will be ready. But you've got to do that within the bounds of what your normal expectation is, and there's no such thing as a normal year because you just don't, they're all different. And so that's the, the variation that needs to be catered for. And fortunately, in New Zealand, we've got a range of microclimates or of some variation. So that allows some mixing and matching to meet those requirements. Right. So as the, the weather may fall differently on different parts of New Zealand, that will then impact the supply curve depending yes. on you know, where that farm is. So this is an inherent aspect of our, of our industry, and it's the double-edged sword. Our comparative advantage internationally is that we can grow grass in most parts of New Zealand most, most of the year, unlike many countries, and unlike actually the countries that we export to, because that's our advantage. We can house our animals. We don't sorry, have to house our animals. They can be kept outside in a free-range process, so a grass-based free-range in comparison to housed and carrying feed is a relatively low cost production system. So our comparative advantage is based on our ability to grow grass and to have animals free ranging outside. The downside is that uh, the vagaries, because grass production is weather dependent, you know, seasonal and weather dependent, then that introduces the variation. So that can make us less reliable suppliers. So we're relatively low cost compared to the rest of the world, but we're also have a degree of unreliability, um, and we uh, we have some distance from the market. So the dis distance from the market is a two-edged again because because we're a long way away. Then we're well clear of of the polluting aspects of high density, higher populations have in comparison to our low density population. Um, uh, but uh, and we have the freight component, but actually the freights. Not that significant because uh, shipping by sea is a very efficient means of delivering. Uh, we can get you know, our cartons of, of lamb products from here 12,000 miles away for less than it costs to truck it from the port to the de depot to the supermarket, say, within the United Kingdom, for example. And then, uh, thanks to Archimedes, our vessels can take a large weight of product you know, for the for the diesel that they consume to actually get it there, so they're not having to support their weight. So the cost the is still in that last mile of transportation to get it to the, the supermarket or to that retail environment. What are the main markets now in 2017 for Progressive? Like which, which countries are the ones that are going to be the, the growth countries for us over the next five to ten years? Well, like... Prospects further out, if I went more than 10 years, I, I think India's um, an exciting prospect. A good you know, large population, a good proportion of their population are already sheep meat eaters. And it's a case of as their uh, domestic product increases and their disposable income comes to a level where they can afford to eat more red meat, that they'll be inclined to do so. Um, China's already um, also a common um, eater uh, of lamb. And they are taking a significant proportion, and one doesn't expect that to decline. When it comes to actually value, uh, we still find that um, in various parts of Europe, both the continent, France, and the United Kingdom, currently still for for leg meat, um, Japan for shoulder cuts, and North America, particularly United States, 
more so than Canada with regard to the middle cuts. But we are seeing uh, part of trends towards it being um, acceptable and fashionable to have other cuts of meat being presented at retail and particularly around slow-cooked items. So it's not just chops um, anymore, which is an exciting prospect for us. I, I, I see, um, you know, United States has, has appeared to offer a lot of potential for over 30 years and we're really not much further ahead than we were, so don't have a tradition of eating that. But we're hopeful that the millenniums, the next generation through, um, will have both the disposal income and the inclination to try, you know, different things. So an order um, of importance for value would be Europe. By volume would be China. And then the mixture, as I said, the parts of the carcass um, going to other, there's a generalisation, shoulder meat to Japan, racks to the United States, uh, boneless loins to Switzerland. So it really is that fragmented. You can, as a, as a country, specialise just in one cut of one part of the animal if, if that's what the, the country demands, for example. Well, only if you're one step removed from the, from the sort of price you can buy from someone else uh, because, remember, as you said before, the carcass comes with all the pieces. Yeah. And so we're a disassembly process we buy. So it's, and that, that has a significant impact on your behaviours in the industry and the demands to be successful. A question on the millennials, because I asked um, Greg Hart on here from Mangarara Farms. I said, you know, there is a um, there is a preference or a belief that eating meat equals bad for the environment. And he said that's not the case. Actually having rice and importing of rice uh, and the energy that goes into that can be as bad if not worse. And that meat is one of the most nutrient-dense sources that we can get of calories uh, and that it's all about balance. When there's developing countries you know, moving up in, not not in the food chain, but more in aspirations to eat better and not be in poverty and eat in a way where they're getting access to things that we maybe had access to for the first time in the 50s and the 60s, what does that mean overall for, um, for I guess, the, the planet part of it? Is what we're doing here going to um, help or hinder where um, where things go with the climate side of things? Well, a very broad question. The if we have, actually if we have a look at feeding the world's population, I don't believe we're in that business, and certainly not in lamb. I mean, lambs are relatively expensive uh, meat, um, pretty well everywhere in the world, um, except possibly New Zealand, maybe <laughs> where it's the least expensive. But even even so, that's not so much the case um, now as it used to be in the past. And there's classes of land uh, that you can't get a tractor over. So even if you you know wanted to plant it out and you can't flood it to grow rice, etc., it's not suitable for that form of production. So it lends itself towards pastoral farming with grasslands, and then so that's going to be depending on the nature of the country, it'll be cattle or sheep, or generally a combination of both. Right. So that that land um, lends itself to that particular um, application, and then you have farming practice. So the problems that, that can arise from almost any enterprises uh, is, is when you have a very heavy concentration of them in one spot. So, for example, if I use a dairy shed analogy, that when you bring the cows into milk and that they're sitting there for the first half hour, there's hardly any muck. Then the last half hour, there's an hour's milking is most of the muck. And now it's all in one place and you have to get rid of it. So now you've got to have a mechanism to be able to collect it up into a pond and then to spread it around. Now, if those same cows were out in the paddock and were rotationally grazed, which, is, which they in fact are, all of the muck they drop in the paddock is not an issue. It's actually a benefit. As long as it's spread, it all becomes part of the biological yeah. process. So then you get a concentration of people, if I use that example, in a city with high rise buildings, you get a whole lot of you know motor cars and generations, etc. So if you if you go to the big cities around the world, it's one of the things I love about New Zealand, whenever I come back, you know, I can smell the air and see the horizon and, and I can see the stars. But in many cases overseas I don't see the stars and I can't see the horizon because of the haze, which is just small and it's a a lot of a concentration. So New Zealand's, as I said, our comparative advantage is long, narrow country, prevailing westerly winds, whatever our four million people do generate in the cause of activities, not long before it's blown out to sea, as they say, I think 80 miles is the furthest you can actually be from the sea anywhere in New Zealand. And it's hard to know a day in our country um, where we don't have any wind. 
it's always something blowing it somewhere. So that you know lends to the do you know to our environment that we're in. So the, the management point, as far as you know, red meat meat goes, um, it's like uh, the best advice I ever think I've received from a nutritionist was a lecture by Massey said that anything in excess is a poison. Right. And so the, the key thing was um, variety and don't you know not in excess. So we know that red meat is a lot of um, of the vital nutrients that are required. And yes, you can get those from other foods, but you may have to eat a lot more of spinach to get your iron requirement in comparison to meat, which is you know why red meat's advocated for you know young women in particular because of their blood losses through menstruation. It's very beneficial. And you may note that beef and lamb and the promotion of the Iron Maidens, that's the very reason why they pick young sporting women as their... Um, is the image for eating red meat is for that reason. It's all about iron. They call them the iron maidens. So that's you know a key key component. Uh, but that's a really source. Sure, you can get it through pills, but you can actually you know, enjoy a nice piece of red meat at the same time and get your iron content. What is your favourite cut of meat? What um, you know if you're going home for dinner and um, what's the thing that you enjoy to either cook or, or you know eat? What's the rack of lamb? It's top, isn't it? Yes, with mint, lemon. Um, you can do it in a number of different ways. I, I actually like prefer mine um, sort of encrusted either with a herb, or the herb crust or with seasoning salts is um, often just more than enough, just just a nice little tang. And it's quick to prepare and it's extra, extremely rare that you'll ever get a bad experience. It's extraordinarily uh, consistent in its tenderness. And it presents very well on the plate. I think it's the number one restaurant item bar none. And if I'm cooking on the barbecue, it's one of the easiest things to do and has the best outcome. You know, the grandkids just love it, their lollipop chops. That's the thing, it comes with its handle already there. Um, and you're right, I think for restaurants, it is that it gives a little bit of height on the plate. Yes. Um, it gives a way to put a bit of theatre around it. I'm um, just going back to the question on the, on the city. So I've just come back from New York yesterday and... You know, I you know, totally agree. Coming back, you fly in, you see the green grass, the blue sky, and you know it is a world away from the reality of billions of people. Who there's more people in big cities than there is out of big cities on the planet now. So for them, you know, New Zealand's kind of the exception to how they live, and they see it as a as a, as a sort of different place. Um, I was at a conference there around marketing, but and it also touched on AI and machine learning and how that's going to change where we live, what we do for jobs, uh, and particularly um, how it's going to transform companies where there are a lot of uh, manual jobs now. So, for example, the head of Reuters showed how they had automated marketing jobs to post out 100,000 pieces of content a month instead of 2,000. And the whole room was just in shock because that's what all of our jobs as marketers is to do, is to get content out to people. And they've automated it with machines. You know, Overlaying that in a business like yours with you know, your uh, leadership around continuous improvement, how much of a role do, does machinery and automation help your current set of workers? And where do you think or where would you like to see it end up? I think you used the word continuous, and I think it's actually it is a it is a continuous process, uh, and you know, we are undergoing you know currently a major capital expansion that's really based around uh, productivity improvements, uh, which are measured in sort of labour productivity, but it comes about through mechanical assistance. So our challenge, uh, in particular, uh, because of this, we're a disassembly process with a natural product, which has got its own inherent variation, and that makes the application of robots and automation ch particularly challenging to deal with that variation. And I've been involved in projects looking at robotics for slaughter since the mid-1990s, and we're really not a lot further ahead now, even though there's been continuing work both here and elsewhere and other plants and industry organisations. I'm a member of um, Ovine Automation Limited as one of the consortium of meat companies looking at slaughter. So the only um, current application of robots, and we're having one installed here, is with regard to uh, cutting a carcass up. So this it's now it's already using x-rays to determine the point at which the cuts will happen. So that's an assistance, will be assistance and a consistency of yield, just because the robot will be able to do it consistently 
more accurately than a human being. So a human being can do it quite well, but they might score it right 95 times out of 100 when the robot will do 99.9 times out of 100. So that process is going, and, and it's a necessary part of the development. If we look back to, um, I can say to people, well, just think about what your grandparents did and how often did they go to the restaurant to eat out? Could they afford to, to do that? How much leisure time did they have? Or And the other one is what level of disposable income did they have after they'd covered the mortgage and the other bits and pieces? And then my case, my grandfather, free wanted if they wanted a chicken for dinner, then they probably had to catch it and they'd chop its head off and then they'd have to pluck it and gut it and do all of that preparation. They didn't go and buy a pre-cooked one from the supermarket. In fact, it wasn't available. And the peas would have been picked from the garden and you would have potted them, etc. And now you buy the packet in the space of two generations. Um, the amount of time, in my case, how many times did I go with my family to a restaurant? And I, I would think, oh, you know, I can't remember. You know, was it once? And, and it wouldn't have actually been a, pro- a full-blown restaurant. It probably would have been the equivalent of a cafe. I mean, and now I compare that to what we did ourselves and then what our daughters are doing and their family, it's a world apart. And so this ability to do that is a consequence of, I think, productivity improvements, which allows fewer people to do more in less time. Mm. And that means that they now have more time for leisure. So what's sparked in a major movement and where people are occupied you know, within the, the economy is into service-related areas. I mean, you can hardly walk down a main street in any town without stumbling over one cafe sidewalk after another. So how can it be that we've now got time to sit down to have you know lattes and cups of coffee and chat at time, and they do it with only with friends and with children and family. And so all the people are involved in preparing that food and serving us as, as an example of a sector that wasn't there two generations ago, just didn't exist. And there are many other examples around tourism. You know, in the recent last, well, I suppose, 10 to 20 years, um, cycleways and bikes on the backs of cars and people actually, you know, they're spending their leisure time doing energetic things. Because during work hours it may not be as energetic. Correct, yes. Well, depending on the nature. Now, our, our work force and our workplace and the industry has still got a high labour content and I think is likely to continue to do so for the foreseeable future, primarily because of the inherent variability in the nature of the material that we are dealing with and the human is so much more adaptable. So machines are very good for repetitive tasks and if there's any variation then that gets to be difficult for them to be programmed to deal with. But what I see it as a continuing trend and we'll continue to evolve in that direction. More and more of what we do will have um, mechanical assistance along with it and as a consequence our productivity is per person which we must continue to strive to improve will, will go up um, and people's incomes over time will go up and their leisure time and their disposable income will also increase. Now, Progressive Meats is a large operation. We have over 300 people work in the company. And it's not necessarily an easy industry to learn. You know, it's not something you can necessarily go on the internet and, and try for yourself at home easily with your own, you know, animals, for example. Um, you know, if, if there's a if you're a 22 year old grad out there, what's the best way to get started in the industry in 2017? You mean started as an employee, or started if you think you'd like to start as in your own account? Uh, I think probably the, the former rather than the latter. But, you know, happy to answer both. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's no different from any other career path. To the extent is that you may look to, to choose, you can easily research various companies now, and you may choose to think that there's one that's, that's preeminent in its field and they would be a good people to work for to learn um, to enhance my career position and you'd seek to apply for a position. And if you're really keen what you do, you, would, you wouldn't be too um, concerned about what the job was to begin with, but you'd actually start, and even better still if you start as a student, you, you spend some time just working on the floor. So you're equivalent of labouring, you learn how to sharpen a knife and do those sorts of things, and that provides you with some income to help you through your, through your studies. But it actually... Um, Probably more importantly in the long run, it it gives you an appreciation for the whole scope of what things are done and it forms a mental image for you, which is really important. Going forward, it's the same talk about something, you actually know what that entails or what that means. Um, 
and across the various various ranges. And then, I mean, from, I'm talking from my own experience because that's actually what I did. And at the time, I didn't appreciate the value of it, but subsequently I've come to do so. Even though I was told at the time I would appreciate it in the future, I still was not necessarily believing that that would be the case. So come into the organisation, do whatever task-based jobs you're assigned, knowing that on reflection, once you've done a lot of different specialist roles, you will then have that umbrella vision around. So you need to have the confidence that, that in the company that the, the people will um, recognise. It, it all depends on on your view in terms of the timeline because we're, as young people, we're impatient and we want it to happen yesterday and we're not necessarily sure when it's not definite. It's when will I get the opportunity? I know from the experience that there, we can always make use of good people and good people are ones that actually show initiative to actually want to learn and to take on and they're the first people you go to when an opportunity arises for a promotion to take them on into the organisation and to give them further options. So they show a keenness and a willingness and a capability then there's a, a natural progression through the ranks uh, and once you've got experience in one company you're not necessarily limited to that company either in terms of um, op- op- this openings are opening, sorry, opportunities are opening up all the time. Excellent. So if anyone's listening there thinking this is an industry that they want to get into, uh, certainly there's opportunities here to be able to make your mark if you've got the right attitude and, and willing to put in the work and do that over a number of years, not just a number of months. There's, well, it takes time to learn all of the nuances. Yes. Uh, it tends to be... Um, I suppose a lag phase when you, as you build your your inherent knowledge, and then the growth opportunities can be exponential. Uh, now, in twenty fifteen, you were awarded Entrepreneur of the Year. What do you believe is your favourite year of business? Now, looking back, being in business over thirty years, is there a particular year that you would award yourself or your company as that was a standout year? I've never thought of it like that, and I don't have a particular year but that I would call a standout year, but there are particular years that I'd call landmark years where they they denoted a significant shift um, as businesses arrive at crossroads as to what are you going to do, then you have to make some choices, and then, of course, all of the subsequent things are a consequence of that decision. So... The, the major one, uh, if I look at my career span, so the, the first of these was when I elected to resign my job with the meat board and to set up a business um, in Hawke's Bay. So that was in April the 1st, 1980. So that, of course, determined a course of action. The first two um, enterprises in the company that I thought I was going to have an association with to start to lease premises off of Hawke's Bay uh, decided not to come after I'd resigned my job and moved here. So the first two proposals um, didn't come to fruition, and it was the third one. So I was got a taste of uh, early retirement at the age of 30 for 18 months um, doing odd work and jobs that I could find while we got established. We started 18 months after I resigned in October 1981, cutting frozen lambs. So in the transition there, the very first customer we, we had uh, was a farmer cooperative out of Paiatua, and they, they went broke, unfortunately, without knowing me significant any significant sums of money uh, there was another customer fortuitously there was a fire at the Timona freezing works and uh, took out their lamb cutting room and so I was able to provide services to them and to other parties then there was meat board ownership of product in the early 1980s as a consequence of the schedule prices dropping or the returns to being less so that they were contemplating the meat companies charging the farmers to have their animals slaughtered so there was no net return in the meat board in retrospect, rightly said, we can't have that situation. They dipped into the reserve funds that had been accumulated from the Second World War to fund um, the payments to farmers um, in the, over approximately three years. And in that process, we were very small. We had a continuity of work, which provided us with them with a reasonably sound financial base. And when that work ran out, and I was going to run out, so then a, a crossroads event for myself was came in late 1980, well, during the course of early 1987, and I'd anticipated that I'd have to get involved in lamb slaughter or get out because the people that I was doing work for, which was the, was called the smaller third-party companies who were buying from the big companies and exporting, the independent exporters they were called, 
were being squeezed because the big companies said, well, we should be doing this ourselves. So that's what I did. So that was a crossroads, 1987 in October. Probably the next was, um, in terms of, uh, there was a period of consolidation, then we elected um, the Fenison Company I'd been doing work for on a contract basis here. They went into receivership in uh, 92, I think it was. And so we, we purchased that facility from the Venison Company here and in fielding and went with my partner John Signal in the fielding operation on Venison Packers. So that you know that got us involved directly in Venison Processing again on behalf and with the land and fielding we then together John and I we built a plant in, to slaughter lambs and supply them to Bernard Matthews in Waipaka around 95. That went quite well and they liked what we did and they said well we'd really like some more uh, because the other parties are becoming less keen to supply us with carcasses. So together with them, we built a plant in Gisborne in 1998. And as a consequence of having built those two plants in a relatively close period of time, I realised that the slaughter board I built here in 1987 was really no longer competitive from a productivity viewpoint. So we rebuilt the Hastings facility here in 2000. Got it. commissioned. Uh, which, you know, interestingly now is actually that new slaughter board is already older than the one that I replaced from the very first one that we, we built. So every time one of those plants is popping up, you're learning from the previous plant saying, let's improve all these things. And then by the time you're back to your original plant, that then needs replacing. Yes. And that's continuous improvement. Yes. Excellent. Well, our time is almost up. So last question, outside of work, Craig, what keeps you busy? What keeps you excited? Um, I think life's pretty good as a whole. Um, I enjoy uh, my farming interests, which um, has come from the mid-90s on more direct involvement, although I, I did become a, a technically a farmer from about 1982 when the ownership of a single a single stag. Uh, and I've got a keen interest in, in sports and uh, we always seem to find these things to do, a little bit of tennis. I've played social cricket for a number of years, yeah, swim a little bit and uh, sail a little bit. We've got the opportunity to do all of those things. And uh, my wife and I elected a number of years ago, never knowing how how much uh, life was going to be left necessary, that we started to travel. So we've always gone somewhere pretty well once a year for the last 20-odd years and continue to do that as long as our health allows us to do so, which is... Um, not showing any signs of abating yet. Excellent. Keep the mind fresh and the, and the body too. Where's next on the international trip list? Well, there are a number of places we haven't been, uh, but there's parts of South America, I think, that we'd, we would like to go to and a few places we might like to go. We'd like to do the Upper East Coast of the United States again and the colours in that part. Um, there's never, not a shortage of uh, destinations. It's a big world. Yes. Lots to explore. Thank you very much for your time today, Craig. Really appreciate it. And I think the insight you've shown into progressive meats and your personal story interwoven there um, has been fascinating. And to you know to hear that firsthand, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Good luck. Thanks, Craig. If you like this episode, remember to subscribe for free on iTunes. Simply search for The Ryan Marketing Show in the iTunes Store.